Hi, this is James Gordon, Victoria Library here for a book review today. Before I begin with the review, I will discuss uh, what happened to the other two books I was reading. First, with Burning Chrome. When I was reading the collection, uh, it turned out to uh, be not that good as I was hoping it would be. With the only decent story, John Numeric uh, was the only s somewhat good story, but even that one, um, ha I had some issues with, I didn't like with that uh, story either. So I thought it would be pointless to do a review on, on a collection of, of stories that I didn't uh, like. And the other book that turned out to be another disappointment was on um, Target Self. Towards the end, uh, it wasn't making a lot of sense, and there were some scenes I was scratching my head just trying to piece together what the hell was going on. And it, it just wasn't really um, a book I thought that was worth um, m mentioning uh, mentioning at all. So that's why I haven't posted anything. Uh, you may have seen my Summer Slaughter trailer of a bunch of books that I'll be reading uh, during, this, during this summer. Um, however, before summer kicks off, uh, I decide to read one book before, before uh, summer starts. And the book I'll be discussing in today's review is Nothing Lasts Forever by Robert Forp. This was published in 1979 by Norton Publishing. This, this is the book that was based off the hit 1988 action film, Die Hard. And during my review, I will discuss both uh, about the book and film, which I think is better, and the question that everyone probably wondering at the end, do I consider Die Hard a Christmas movie? I'll say that uh, during my final thoughts uh, towards the end of this video. Now on to the book review, and spoiler alert, as I will be giving away crucial details within the story. Plot. Ex-private detective and NYCPD cop Joe Leland, now living in St. Louis, is riding back seat in a taxi during a snowstorm on his way to the airport to visit his daughter, Savia Gennaro, who lives in Los Angeles and works for the powerful American oil company, Klaxon Oil Corporation, on Christmas Day. Along the way, Joe's taxi driver gets into a fender bender with another man in a station wagon. The driver... Angry orders the taxi driver out for a fight. The taxi driver tries apologizing, but this angry fat man wants violence, then tries getting to the car. Slamming his foot onto the accelerator, hoping to lose him, however, the taxi is nearly rammed off the road by this enraged man. Joe points his browning high-powered pistol at the angry driver and threatens to shoot him if he doesn't back off. Once Joe reaches the airport, he thanks the taxi driver, pays him, and, and goes for his luggage in the trunk when the man... The man in the station wagon shows up again. Joe calls a cop over who recognizes him and informs the officer what happened and has the fat racist man arrested, allowing the taxi driver to leave safely and Joe boards his plane to L.A. During the flight, we learn of Joe Leland's background when he used to work as a detective and his last case that ended in disaster, which Joe still has guilt of sending the wrong man to the electric chair. Even though he found and killed the, the murderer, along with his marriage after returning from the second world war as an ace pilot at the beginning joe's marriage was great but after the events of the detective and a falling out with, with a friend of his joe joe's life fell apart which led to depression along with him becoming an alcoholic causing his daughter stephanie to flunk high school and run away after having enough of their fights which led to a divorce however a few years later stephanie began talking with her parents again which joe started to rebuild his damaged relationship with his daughter while things didn't work out well with, with her mother. While Joe is proud that Stephanie has a good paying job, mother of two children, however, what he's not happy about is her sleazy husband, Harry Ellis, who met Stephanie at college and has a drug addiction, which Joe suspects that Stephanie might be snorting cocaine with. Once the plane touches down in LA, Joe is greeted by a black limo driver and takes him to the Clinton building in a black Cadillac limo. After getting through traffic, Joe reaches the Klinkson building, checks in with the front desk with the guard letting him know where the party is being held on the 32nd floor. However, before entering the elevator, Joe spots a Jaguar pull in, but nobody gets out. When Joe reaches the party, he finds young and middle-aged people drinking, passing joints around, while dancing to thumping disco music with flashy lights. One of the employees of the Klinkson points out where Stephanie's office room is, Joe enters as the door wasn't shut to find his daughter sitting with two other men. Stephanie is thrilled to see her father has made it in time for the Christmas party and informs him that she brought her two grandchildren with her, Judy and Mark. Ellis tells Joe that his wife has secured a $150 million deal to 
deal for a bridge in Chile, and the company is getting a major bonus from it. Joe is then greeted by the vice president of Klexon, Mr. Rivers from Texas, who is thrilled about the deal, and to celebrate it, Rivers ruined this massive party. However, Joe dislikes both Ellis and Mr. Rivers. Joe goes to wash up in a private bathroom while talking with Stephanie for a bit, then leaves him while he takes takes off his jacket, removes his shoes and socks, and begins walking across the rug barefoot, making fists with his toes. While waiting for the party to be over, Joe calls a flight stewardess, Kathy, he, he spoke to while on, on his flight. While leaving a message, Joe looks down looks down below from the window and notices a large truck drive into the parking garage of the building he's in. A few minutes later, the phone, phone lines are dead, followed by the sounds of the music. Joe senses something isn't right and suddenly hears gunfire followed by screams. He quickly grabs his Browning High Power and peeks out of the bathroom door to see a swarm of terrorists armed with AK-47s. Knowing he won't, knowing he won't be able to handle all the terrorists himself, Joe makes, makes his way to the stairs and begins climbing up several floors till he's away from every, everything and begins thinking of a plan. Joe happens to reach Mr. Rivers' office room and witnesses the terrorist leader Anton Gruber or Lou Tony or orders Mr. Rivers to open up the company's safe. The Rivers refuses. Lou Tony pulls out his Walter pistol and shoots him in the heart. Joe quickly flees the area and, and makes his way to the top floor. First, he tries cutting the wires on the Klexon logo and uses the lights, trying to flash for help. However, the terrorists see this and send up a young man armed with a Thompson submachine gun. Joe is shocked by the, young, by the young age of the terrorist who tries getting him to surrender. He is chased by him till Joe wh pistol whips him in his head, knocking him down and breaks his neck. Feeling sick but knows he can't stop, Joe takes the submachine gun and checks the shoulder bag to find a few, a few clips of ammo, a CB radio, along with some chocolate bars. Joe takes the dead terrorist, puts him on a chair, then writes a note onto a sheet of paper. He places the body inside an elevator and writes on the top while looking through the vent cover. The terrorists are shocked to find one of their members dead with the, lead, with, with the leader. Little Tony reads the message, now we have a machine gun. Little Tony orders that Carl be sent down so he can tell him his brother is dead while having other terrorist members begin looking for this intruder. Joe returns to the library and tries sending out a mayday call using the CB radio, but Little Tony picks up on the message and tells him, tells him that he won't be able to call for anyone for help. The terrorist, followed by Carl, who's hell-bent on killing Joe, is armed with a BAR-like machine gun, chases and tries killing Joe. He's able to lose them by crawling through the air vents. Joe uses the shoulder bag straps and attaches it to the Thompson, allowing him to climb down through the air duct, crawl out of it, and get past Carl. Joe kills another terrorist and finds inside its shoulder bag lots of C4 and remote detonators. Joe then tries throwing the dead terrorist out the window, hoping someone will see the body. Joe gets into another shootout, killing two more terrorists and barely escapes Carl again. As Joe is patching himself up from his injuries, a police sergeant, Al P Powell, tries contacting the person who sent out the mayday call. Joe quickly informs Al who the terrorists are what horror they are packing, along with the 74 hostages being held on the free second floor, but refuses to tell who he is. Within minutes, police swarm around the Klexon building, followed by SWAT and news reporters. First, they try getting into the office building, but they are greeted by gunfire with several officers being wounded. Joe takes a C4, sticks a few charges into it, attaches it to an office chair with a typewriter to add weight, then Pry opens an elevator shaft with an axe and pushes it down. A few seconds later, a powerful explosion erupts, destroying the lower floors of the, Klex, uh, of the Klexon building, along with killing the, the terrorists, giving police a chance to save any wounded officers. Deputy Chief Dwayne Johnson contacts Joe, stating he wants him to stay out of this as they'll handle it, which Joe refuses and, and tells Johnson off. After killing another terrorist, Joe switches out his Thompson for his AK-47 assault rifle. While resting up, Joe is talking with Al, who is able to patch him through Kathy, stating how worried she is for him as the whole event is being covered on TV. Then, Joe, then Joe's cover is blown when Little Tony ca uh, contacts him and puts Ellis on. He tries convincing him to surrender and hand over the C4 and detonators. Joe refuses and is executed by Little Tony, who threatens to kill another hostage if he doesn't give them back. Little Tony reveals his plans to everyone that's watching by 
expo exposing the corruption of Claxon Oil Corporation by throwing out their dirty secrets and billions of dollars out the window, Joe re realizes that little Tony doesn't plan on leaving nor letting any of the hostages go, as he plans a massive suicide murder by blowing himself up along with the hostages. Joe struggles to keep himself going while being hunted down by the remaining terrorists who are, who are not afraid to die. But Joe won't stop till he kills all of them and saves his daughter along with his, two, along with his grandchildren. But little Tony isn't going to make it easy for him. It's amazing to see where the action-packed film Die Hard came from after seeing this film so many times when I was a young teenager. When, when, I read, when I read about the novel it was based on, my father got me it as a birthday gift when I was beginning to collect novels, and this one I'm proud to have. Now, I have pointed out a few differences from the novel, such as the opening party scene with the disco music, which I'm glad was in the film, along with the firearms used within the novel, which Joe states how deadly the Klashnikov assault rifle is. However, there is more. Little Tony has brought both male and female terrorists, mostly young, with a few older members. And like in the film, Joe uses a fire hose to jump off the rooftop during a gunfight and smashes through the window to get back inside the office building. But some of, but some of these scenes are a bit slower compared to Die Hard, where the action sequence is much faster. There isn't a big fight between Joe and Carl, which was in the film. Some of, the, some of these differences I didn't mind, while others I preferred the film. Now onto what I didn't like. Later on, Joe talks too much on the CB radio once news reporters begin contacting him on the channel, on his channel as as this wastes time. And Joe makes a few mistakes that that nearly gets him killed. Dwayne Johnson is an unlikable character who 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 does nothing but give Joe Leland a hard time and was and was glad to see him get killed off at the end. While this novel was good, however, I felt the film adaptation was a lot better, improving a lot with the story and making it better. But Nothing Lasts Forever is still worth checking out. A little, a little background on where Robert Frum got the idea for this novel. In 1975, Robert saw the disaster film Towering Inferno. Later on that night, he had a dream of a man being chased by other men armed with guns while inside a skyscraper. Robert woke up in the middle of the night, wrote down this wrote down this dream, which became Nothing Lasts Forever. At first, Robert envisioned it as a sequel to his first novel, Detective, which was made into a film starring Frank Sinatra, but declined the offer and was and was too old for an action role. Next, it was pitched as a sequel for Commando, but Arnold also declined the offer, too. Other actors passed the role until Bruce Willis signed on, after it still reworked the project as a standalone film rather than a sequel. That was a very interesting piece of information I found out uh, about um, Die Hard after um, watching and reading some trivia on imdb.com uh, and found out where the author got the idea from. It was very interesting, um, especially that dream. I kind of wish I could see how that dream was. Um, and that's another good film, too, um, The Tower Inferno. I got the one book that it is based on, The Glass Inferno. I do not have the first book that it was based on, The Tower. Maybe one day I'll, I'll read those two books in a future video. Um, yeah, so, as I said, I like the film notation more over the novel. It improves a lot of the story. Um, it, it kind of um, has, like, more better characters. Even Dwayne Johnson, even though in the, the, the book he's a real asshole, at least in the film, he's a, a somewhat a little more better tw uh, tw tw uh, towards the end of the film. You know, the guy acts like a dick. Um, oh, um, oh, yeah, and I decided uh, during my review to um, point out some differences within the book uh, um, and the film rather than to read them out at the end of my review to be, to be more easier. And, hmm, oh, yes, and the, 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 big, and the big question, do I consider Die Hard a Christmas movie? No. Just because it takes place on Christmas doesn't make it a Christmas movie. If it were a Christmas movie, it will have to do something with Christmas. But it doesn't. It's just set on Christmas Day. Uh, another difference within the book is um, it takes place on December 25th, but, it go, but, it, but the, the, the later part of the book goes into December 25th. So, it's, so, it takes, so the story takes place within like um, two, a two-day a two time frame, as in the film Die Hard. Uh, it's just a, a single-night event. And hmm, what else to say? Oh, um, 
And as for the Die Hard series, uh, my favorite films out of the series was the first and, and third one. I uh, really didn't like the second one that much, but I like to read the book that it's um, based off of. And I might check out the uh, Robert Forbes' um, Null Detective. Um, I'm kind of curious to see how good that book is. And without that book, we would not have one of the best action movies of all time ever made. <laughs> all right. That's it for the view today. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, as I said, I will begin um, the, my summer slaughter, starting with um, David J. Scrolls' The Killer, a book I've been wanting to read for a very long time. And I will also try to finish Alter Carbon sometime in May and get a review of that up and um, finish off the Cyberpunk trilogy so I can read some other books as well. So make sure to uh, hit the like button and share share the video and subscribe to the YouTube channel of Autor Library and join the Facebook group of the same name, a place you can post and review fiction. Until then, I'll catch you later, 